Oh. All right. Greetings from the dark continent. Conscious Caracal here, or Adams Van Sale. And tonight we're going to talk about a topic that I think is gaining in popularity in regards to people it, it entering the discourse and people asking very valid questions in regards to how they can change the world, if you can put it that way. Um, I'm not a big believer in that you need to just try and change the world. Uh, you need to try and change your immediate surroundings and your household and your streets and your uh, community, but we're going to get into that later. So uh, to talk to me about, uh, to join me in this conversation about activism in theory and practice is Robert Digan. He's been on the show before. You can go check it out uh, after this. If you missed that episode, we had a very interesting discussion about the current reigning zeitgeist in South Africa, but also abroad. So tonight we're going to be talking about activism rather um, based on not only what Rob has been doing for the past few hours today, but also uh, based on his latest video on his channel uh, discussing the topic in regards to more of the theory behind it. So welcome on the show, Rob. Hi, how's it? Yeah. Um, uh, I think, um, just to start off with, I just wanted to say that um, uh, I wouldn't call myself an expert on this area. I mean, I know some, uh, I know, of, I, I know a few things, um, but uh, all any a lot of the stuff that I know, I unfortunately, because I was quite busy this with this week, um, didn't get a chance to really brush up on like I usually do for the streams for uh germ uh so <laughs> i if if i if i disappoint on details um i hope i will be forgiven uh because i've been trying to put uh theory into practice that's uh kind of the one thing that's been occupying my time so a lot of people uh, can, uh, yeah. can get bogged up by just talking about what needs to be done and being very normative but not really doing it in practice or even uh really being very practical about it they can be very idealistic and uh, head in the clouds in regards to what activism needs to look like and what type of activism succeeds mm -hmm. but then you don't really see anyone uh, taking uh, or following the recipe or really uh, having that type of ideal manifest in reality yes this is true but i think part of it is also that um a lot of things that we're aware of with uh, with activism they don't get converted they don't get converted and uh, what i mean by that is they don't you don't um so let's so now uh, afri forum is very good at conversion because you actually build um a steady body of people who rely on afri forum for certain information or to solve certain kinds of problems and so what you're doing is you're converting the, the the sort of casual participant who's interested in the single issue into someone who's participating in a broader program or at least building some kind of private institution. Hmm. So that that's that's a big thing. That's that's how you uh, convert um, lots of small you know local level things into a bigger picture. And you know you get things like, and this is how how uh, single issue protests become movements. But I think the big thing with single issue protests is that they also have have their own sort of version of this, which is that uh, it's at a smaller scale, of course, but it, it's more or less how do you convert casual people into people who actually you can organize into in, in into specific behavior? Because sharing something on social media is one thing. The trick is that you get them to. Uh, you, the, the trick is that you get them to participate. So you, you, you get them to do something outside of just clicking share or clicking like. Mm. Um, so, for example, in this, uh, the, 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 one, the one thing that I was looking at that's, that, that's a very big feature of um, how should I put it, commitment conversion, as I would call it, um, would be things like using petitions properly. A lot of people will think of a petition as the kind of casual thing that students would use or sort of casual activists on the side of the road. They'll get you to sign your name next to something, yeah. and then it's kind of vague, and you don't know what it's about. But the proper use of a petition is not just getting the names that says, oh, there are a lot of people who support me. It's also getting contact information from people and getting them to, to show up when there's, uh, when there's something to be done, whether it's a protest, whether it's a fundraiser, or whether it's anything like this. And so one of the things that, that happens, and it is very irritating for people who want to only, um, you know, participate very casually, 
is that they are probably going to get contacted and they're going to be asked to help out again once they've helped out already. <laughs> so it's, you don't uh, like my uh, my grandfather always said today's favor is tomorrow's obligation. Well, this is true. Uh, unfortunately, but but this is the this is the th this is the thing about all of it is that you know um, you, protests are irritating. You become an extremely irritating person uh, mm. organizing for anything. Yeah, you uh, a bit cringe. Yes, I think that's the big thing is that there's there's always a cringe about it, and even if you even if you ignore the the irritation factor that you represent to people, there's also the thing of like a lot of the stuff that you have to do for uh, for for protesting, even on the level of just like or writing the single post that you put out online, it's kind of embarrassing and false and and and, and silly, but you have to do it. And pretty much everything that you're starting afresh is embarrassing and false and silly. It's always going to feel that way because it starts off, quite, it starts off always quite awkward. Mm. But um, I mean, it's the same with acting. Where If you can't let go of your ego, you're not going to be able to really sell your performance or to really excel in theater. And there is an element of theater in, uh, in protest as there is in many elements of politics. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, when you go back to the Greeks, with the way they talk about rhetoric, there's there there's not really a, a massive a hard line between the concepts they use for um, for rhetoric and perform for rhetoric and performance. I mean, you read Aristotle's Poetica, and you sort of get a lot of these like recurring little themes that you see over and over again. I mean, of course, it's not the same as this book on rhetoric. I mean, but. Mm. The, the the big things of you know rhythm and um and sort of rhythm rhythm and gesture and em uh, emotion and things like that also the power of symbolism i mean symbolic inferences are extremely important and i think the thing is when you look at something like a, a protest i mean there's a group in uh germany i've forgotten their name but they actually they're actually pretty well funded and their their entire position is to come up with creative public theater for political ends. I don't know. So I, 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 it was from, it was, they were big a few years ago. They've sort of, they, they keep a low profile um, because they, they sort of act like a brand trust for other activist organizations. Hmm. Um, uh, just before you continue, Rob, I just want to be, uh, do a very big mm -hmm. shout out here to Neil Pretorius. Uh, he was my flatmate uh, back in Stellenbosch when and saw the conscious character thing take off. I mean, he was there when I did my first interview listening through the wall. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much for tuning in, Neil. And I, um, he's somewhere in, uh, in the east. I don't know if he wants all this personal information out there. So I'll just, uh, I'll just leave it there. But yeah, um, thanks for tuning in, Neil and Nila. Um, it's excellent to, to see you here. And I'm glad you're excited for this episode. I see there's a lot of guys in the chat that's also been uh, sticking around for this one. But yeah, Rob, uh, to, to get back on point, uh, you actually uploaded a video uh, quite recently on more the theory of activism and how to really go about it. What uh, what prompted that? What uh, what made you think that this is the type of... I mean, it is a bit of a departure from your regular content. What made you uh, take that course? Well, literally, it was because a, a friend of mine actually called me up about this, and he said... Uh, he, so they had this... Uh, the He's he's like a... He's an intern for... Um, uh, for an advertising company. And they had this client of theirs there who hired them to do like a little documentary to help with their fundraising. Like, I don't know, it was a few months ago. Um, and I mean, he'd asked my, my advice on, on, on like, you know, what video software to use. Cause I use this, um, like extremely low end thing. Cause my, my, my computer is a bit, clunky and uh, limited in its capacity so i use i use a, a video editor that is literally like the first one uh, the first like complex video editor you can get before you the last one before you get into the like shitty um like windows movie maker knockoffs uh, and it's called <laughs> shotcut and it's, it's pretty good it does all you need to do but i mean it can't do a lot of complex things a lot of like fancy um uh, effects and whatnot, but it does run on a slow computer, which is good. 
um, and allow me to do what it is. So I recommended that to him to stitch the the documentary together. Um, and uh, he comes back to me recently with this thing because the the people he did it for this this animal charity they 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 do um, what they do is they started out as like a, an animal sterilization clinic. So they were there for helping reduce the population of stray animals, which, I mean, they, the stray dogs attack people. They they also sort of produce a lot of animals that are very su uh, that suffer because they can't be looked after. Poor people can't afford to go to the vet. It's so, so it's kind of, a, it was kind of a necessary service for animal welfare perspective, but it, it, it developed another dimension to it because a lot of people in Kailicha who are very, um, uh, very poor, their kids or themselves, they, they might, they come into contact with these dogs um, mm. and they'll pick up the, they'll pick up really, really horrific diseases because I mean, I mean, look, we all know coronavirus is transferred from a bat, but this is not actually as rare as people think. Uh, diseases transferred from animals are quite common. Uh, plagues used to hit Europe in the middle ages all the times because you had rats and you had cows and you had horses and donkeys and goats and all kinds of things wandering through the street all the time. And people in constant contact with animals at, in large numbers, in densely populated areas, it, it's a breeding ground for, uh, for exotic diseases. And I mean, the diseases that you can get, catch, like, uh, like um, sarcoptic mange, is just, I mean, it's, it's horrifying. Um, I mean, there's a couple of quick shots I showed. The, the ones that I didn't show are things like a roundworm, which are way more horrifying to look at. I was suggested not to include um, images of that. Um, but it's far too horrifying to see people with worms crawling in their eyeballs and things. Nice. So you you don't uh, yeah so that's that's the kind of thing that they're treating as well. Uh, they 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 hand out me a medication that sort of reduces this the, these problems. And by spaying and neutering the animals, they bring the population on. Because in two years, you can get a you can get a wild uh, population. Well, not a wild, a feral population, more specifically, of like two thousand dogs from from only two breeding pairs. So it's it's uh, it's it's really really rapid how it builds up if you don't have anyone doing this kind of work, and so we, we sort of take this for granted because it's kind of been running in the background in developed countries for a long time, and in South Africa we always had uh, we always had like uh, SPCA or all of these different things, but they they sort of developed a shortage because there's not enough of them to go around. There's not a lot of, not, not a lot of our volunteers and it becomes expensive to do it. And there's government regulations and the economy is not good. And all of the usual sort of fabric of society stuff that gets in the way of this. And, uh, and then what happened recently is that they had people show up because there's like a slight there's a vacant area near um around them that's as zoned for public housing but of course all construction of public housing is stopped because of covid right so um during this all of the um a lot of uh, private syndicates uh, are taking advantage of this and they're going out and plotting all of the land that's made up for public housing uh laying it out and They've done it in 260 different sites across Cape Town since the uh, across the Greater Cape Town area since the start of lockdown. Okay, I mean, obviously not the same syndicate necessarily, but it's it's good money to be made because you plot it out, you whack together a shacks in like a day, you can whack like dozens of them can go up in a day because a shack is it's a shack. You're nailing sheet to poles, you know. Four walls and a roof. Exactly, it's, it's really really not much. So then you then they rent this stuff out to people for like 2k, one and a half k, whatever it is. I mean, that's money in the bank for nothing, you know. Um, so I mean, the people are showing up there driving Mercedes and shit, you know. Um, so it's not like the locals are doing this. And the problem is the locals also know that these people are gangsters and they bring lots of shenanigans. And so the people who are living in the, the government housing 
uh, they get they they don't want anything to do with this. They want the people to go away. But then there's also sort of uh, youngsters and newcomers and backyarders. Not if you don't know what a backyarder is, these are people who rent out a small like Wendy house or shack or just a smaller building or back room uh, in someone else's house. And so they've got they've got like a couple of children or whatever usually illegitimate and they'll decide um no i don't want to pay rent and i don't want to live in a small place i want my own house and so i'm going to go over here and so they help they'll they'll volunteer to help out with these syndicates in plotting the land out and that pushes them up the list means they can get a place i mean they still have to pay rent to these gangs but um it's usually not much more than the back room and they get more space out of it. Um, of course, they're stealing it from people who are who have been waiting for public housing for twenty years. Usually, um, you know, people who've lived in the Cape since before the end of apartheid. And so there's a lot of resentment amongst the coloured community. Hence, people like Hartful Cape Tonians, you know, the the sort of Cape nativist movements. Um, but this is in Kailicha, and so it's actually it's actually black on black sort of issues um and an a, a, a firefight actually broke out uh, a few days ago um uh 12 days ago now um yeah it was 12 days ago there's there shots rang out on the on the road there between um local residents and settlers and i mean like no one was injured but i mean that's a pretty that's serious situation hard tensions are high and so it's not i mean look there, there are people who look at this and go ah you know it's kyle leach or whatever you know um but i mean it it sort of isn't isn't i mean we know that we know there's a big issue with most most of kyle leach is an informal settlement anyway it's 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 no it's no um it's not uh sort of state secret or anything um but it there are there are degrees here and um, the problem is that the, the police showed up to, they cleared away like one or two of the shacks. And it's weird because they the, the second wave of shacks went up in a day. Like so this it was, police response was prior to your uh, action today? Yeah, no, this is all prior. So the police showed up, knocked down, there was one shack, that one or two shacks that were up, right? And the police showed up, knocked them down, um, talked to the 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 um, the, the sort of organizing uh, mobster people for a bit, and then went away. And then they were, and then they refused to help out. They refused to look up the um, the registration plates of these vehicles. They refused to pursue the case any further. And I mean, the these people were. And, and those who were hoping to benefit from their project um, threatened the staff and uh, told them, no, we want your water and we want your power. And if you don't give it to us, we're burning your place down and we're taking it. And so, of course, they call the police and say, well, we're getting this, this and this. And then um, the, the policeman says, no, um, yeah, I don't know. You can like uh, file an intimidation charge if you like. Um, but we're not really going to do anything. And if they come after you, that's, uh, that's your own business. Um, so, uh, good luck. Mm. So that's basically that response. And then they went to the, the, uh, uh Tamsin who runs the show, um, who runs the, 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 the clinic. She, uh, she went to the counselors for help, but the counselors are kind of scared. I mean, past couple of years they've had their houses burned down by by pe by people who who are engaged in shack farming which is this practice you know they've they've had attempts on their lives it's already mm. popular right uh, so now this is the the background context uh what were your actions specifically today in regards to your your approach to trying to assist this uh, this community well, it's 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 not really complicated. I mean, this is very this is very shallow. this is the thin end of the wedge. So I'm doing sort of the the early stages stuff where you try and get people to pitch in and put pressure on um, key decision makers because that's the big deal. Is you actually want people to call up the, those who make um, who make the decisions on whether to move or act on issues, 
and you tell them um, this is an issue that's important to me. That this is an issue that's you know morally important. This is your job. You need to do it. You, you know, and I mean, there's two there's two reasons you might want to do it. Uh, well, there's two motivations I should say. Is one, there are people in charge who don't really feel like doing their job for whatever reason. They need a kick in the pants. And then there's people who are who are who are either scared or have a defeatist attitude, and they just need encouragement. They need to have someone believe in them and say, "Well, you're not the only. You're not alone." As you know, sort of uh, an isolated, honest official here. There are people behind you who want to see you do your job. So, you know. Um, because otherwise all people hear is criticism. And this is one of the things that blindsided us is we were hoping to go out with this yesterday and then there was IT issues and so on. Um, but what happened yesterday is that the uh, there was that case that was uh, decided about the, the, the land evictions in, uh, in Cape Town. You remember that uh, naked bugger who... Um, Stripped mm. naked and went back inside his shack. I mean, there's how do you manage to let people take photos of you doing this before the police show up? Right. I mean, it's colossally incompetent. And despite the fact that it was obviously staged, um, because it made you know it so affected his dignity, mm. the uh courts decided that no, you can't evict people anymore. I mean, look, All let's right, let's I be strict. That. What, yeah, but let's be strict about what they ruled. They ruled that the um you need to get individual uh, court mandates for every eviction. Hmm. So now, of course, that's yeah, a, that's, that's an impossible barrier. I mean, everyone knows. Those hmm. are the South African Human Rights Council goes. Oh well, I don't care if this means that everyone get uh, everybody gets turfed out of their house by the uh, by the um, uh, by those who are looking to resettle to the city. I don't care if they don't get uh, the if native Cape Townians don't get the houses they're waiting on. This is a matter of principle, which of oh. course I, I honestly, I'm not, uh, makes me question their principles. Do you but, think there's a, there's an ideological angle to this ruling? Of course there is. I mean, it's, it, of course there is. It's, it's, it's like, you know, landless people, people without houses, people have a right to housing. But what does a right to housing mean? I mean, who who's responsible for delivering it? Because why I'm I asked that question is uh, specifically, yeah. I see a lot of people writing these things still off to just pure incompetence or just uh, malpractice and not really yeah. seeing what's going on. But even people who are not particularly sort of ideologically passionate for for the let people do whatever they like sort of position. Um. There's also sort of uh there's also sort of a reluctance because it's very difficult to uh it's it's very difficult for most people to look at a situation and say, well, I am willing to turf someone out of their home. Because hmm. I mean, obviously it's a, it's an incredibly hefty thing to do. Um <laughs> There was a comment here in the yeah. chat that really, I almost started laughing because it's so good. Uh, Sideliner Opinions asks, are the land grabbers activists? Ah, uh, let's get philosophical about it. Um, no, I guess, I guess a lot of them are. Hmm. But I mean, a lot of them are just people acting in sort of individual self-interest um, in fairly commercial manner. Hmm. Um there is an activism angle. The problem is that all of these different groups who are doing this kind of stuff, they vary very wildly. So there are people who are aligned, who are aligned with the um, the sort of uh, fanatic black nationalist uh, groups, you know, EFF, BLF, all of that lot. They're definitely around. They definitely organize a lot of land invasions. Um, it's It's an open secret. Uh, I think anyone who denies it at this point must be smoking something. Um, but it's not all cases. A lot of the time it's just commercial. Sometimes it's you leave a piece of land open, someone's going to squat on it because, but I mean, you know, you ask yourself sort of who's, who's the typical person who occupies these buildings. And usually it's young men oh. because most young women are not looking, uh, most young women, there are always exceptions. Most young women are not looking for the kind of risk that comes with moving into these areas. Um, 
But of course, there's always economic pressure, so a lot of them take the risks anyway. But I mean, one of the big things that you get is that a lot of young men, rather than living unemployed near their mothers in the Eastern Cape, would rather live or or near their mothers in Kailicha already. Um, they'd rather live far away from their parents, where they can't, uh, you know, where they can do as they please, and risk running into debt with loan sharks and silly things like that for a shack in a plot. So, yeah. You know, so uh, now that I'm um, seeing as you did make a video, a very theoretical video to a certain extent in regards to what activism should be or how you should go mm. about it. When you actually now got your hands dirty today in the in this week rather and started doing it practically, <laughs> were you able to follow your own advice and your own and your own uh, ideals? A little bit. I mean, it was it was very messy. A lot of it came across. Uh, a lot of it was. If I was on the ground, it would be different. Because at the moment, I'm trying to do it from overseas, and it's it feels very. I don't know. It feels like. I don't know how to describe it, but it, it, you feel very removed. It's like you're trying to do. It's like you're trying to tie a knot with brightongs. It feels a bit uh, like that. It you reminds know? me of, uh, I can't remember when it was, but there was this this meme on the internet where there was a live cam that was unsecured uh, somewhere on some street corner, and there was a, a rack of um, postcards that was leaning very precariously to one side. And the whole internet made it their mission to let that rack fall over. And they tried to, from thousands of miles away try to coordinate all types of uh, interesting plans to do it and they succeeded in the end i think after like three days they found a way to do it but uh, it, it reminds me of that type of remote uh, remote manipulation the feeling that you're describing yeah sure but i mean look the problem is if, if if i was if i was able to go there in person i mean i know it's risky for a white person to try this these kind of shenanigans but there's there's one thing that i would have definitely liked to do which is get get the um you go door to door to the houses in the area and you tell them you know this is what this is what's happening do you approve do you not approve um look we're i'm with these guys this is what's going on you get their signatures you get their uh, contact numbers you add them to a whatsapp group um you update them about what's going on the, you get them involved because I'll tell you what, people are, especially in areas of high employment, people are looking for things to do. So, and if they, yeah, they're, they're, I, they're, they're ripe for activism. In fact, mm. I was go as far as to say that um, part of the reason that protest is so violent in South Africa is people are dying for something meaningful to do. They're absolutely dying for something meaningful. To well, me. you can so, see it in the manifestations of online uh, activism as well, whether that be as effective or not. You can see people want to to get involved and want to do something to bring about change. I think sometimes their they means are a bit misguided and they're not really doing anything meaningful. But I think there is a need. You can see that. I think that's the key is that you can see that type of drive uh, actually growing within people, especially in South Africa. Yeah, Um I think, but I think the thing is that nobody knows how to convert their energy. So you get a lot of these sort of big bursts of things. Now, the A and C are absolutely fantastic organizers. Hmm. They are absolutely unparalleled. You, I mean, you can't, you can't even, you, there's nothing to compare it with. Um, so I, I participated in a few of them back in the day when I, when I, I, cause I had a friend who was in the youth league and, I sort of didn't feel the ANC was radical enough because I was, you know, I was a communist at the time. Of course. Um, but there, so I uh, I went along to a couple of these protests, and there's what uh, I mean. I was a. You watch what they do. So they bus people in, and they hand out sandwiches. They hand out free water. They hand out free T-shirts. I mean, like, look, a T-shirt isn't much if you're on a steady income, but if you're really struggling, a T-shirt, I mean, my goodness. Mm. I saw the people buses, handing I mean, out. I was in uh, at Stellenbosch with the Fees Most Four protests as well, and it was pretty blatant. I it was, was like, there. I, I was one of those guys. I was one of those guys who got busted into Stellenbosch. And then, uh, a, few, uh, a few minutes later, there's an entire crowd just manifesting as if they've been airdropped in. 
Yeah, I was one of those guys who was uh, who was bust in um, to Stellenbosch to. But at that stage, I was already feeling doubts, and I was sort of like hanging back, not feeling too much the vibe. Mm. Um, so that's very interesting that you actually have that perspective from the inside. I mean, there are some hectic organizers already in South Africa in regards to people that are incredibly good at this type yeah. of activistic organization. But I mean, one of the things that the ANC's got is, look, they've got a tradition of organizing that goes back to 1912. Mm. But not only that, they have all of the stolen money that they could possibly throw around. So they have no limit to their budget on any level they can do whatever they like if you want to see a really interesting bit of activism actually um you see the way that they sabotage the atm sorry uh, the the african transformation movement the, oh, the, yes, the little yes. party <laughs> so they <laughs> they, they sent those guys in <laughs> yeah they sent thousands of guys in to try uh, to to vote uh to have the party dissolved in the agm <laughs> they paid them thousands of rands each to do it just wadges of cash and you say, and you ask yourself, so how do you compete with that at a national level? It's really intimidating. Yeah. And then they you don't... should also ask yourself if you're part of a movement, uh, let's say, uh, well, I don't even uh, have to name an example. If you're just part of a political movement and the ANC is not taking interest in you, then you need to start asking questions about how much you're really changing. Oh, um, I mean, I think it's different when, if, if look, if you're representing a minority interests, um, they don't really care too much about you because they know that they can crush you if they feel like it. Mm. So they know that if it ever, if you ever became a threat, they could actually just send mobs to literally butcher you. Mm. Um, and and they do that in the in the townships all the time with people who don't uh, who don't cooperate. Is people are absolutely terrified. Politi politics in South Africa is frightening for the ordinary South African. The, well, most uh, of us who most well, of us who sit here. It's not much Sorry, different I'm... than the race of the continent. I mean, this is just uh, South no, Africa uh, fitting into the norm. I don't know. Um, I suppose it depends what you mean by the norm. Um, well, the every norm country's got their own... Of, uh, this type of bullying politics, this politics that's really like not uh, not this uh, civil Western idea of the, the worst you can get is a little bit of a mean protest where they might burn a car. In South Africa, there's actual political assassinations mm. that are not even trying to be hidden or these yep. type of operations where you get for example the the atm party where you just send in a bunch of uh insiders and try and destroy it from the inside and so it the best way to simply put it, it in 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 politics in africa it's very blatant and it's it doesn't have to be hidden that's what gives it almost its own character in the west these things happen i mean you get uh, all types of weird and dark uh, shit happening in, in the western countries and in the western democracies but in african countries it's it's not even there's no attempt even to hide it it's out in the open and they know it because it's it uh, it doesn't matter i don't know i think that south africa you've got you've got one of these sort of dual systems like this yeah. really weird two-phase system is um Sorry, it's raining really heavily in the. Uh, so I'm just going to stand closer to the microphone. But um, you still have most of most of the journalistic classes are composed of people who are very middle class, so they're not touched by any of this violence. So even the even the investigative journalists, the who who sort of really know what's going on, as opposed to the opinion columnists, you know, hmm. the. In, the opinion columnists and the editors tend not to be investigative journalists from from what from what i can tell they tend to have be, they tend to be sort of reporters that then graduated up you know hmm. um i mean like like someone like sam soul for example i like using him as an example because he's he's like one of those really gritty old fashioned you know serious like you know get in deep and uh, dig out the dirt kind of guys um i mean i met him in person uh years ago like 10 years ago when i was in northwest province and i was bartending in this ridiculous little bar in the middle of nowhere in in hurt and uh he uh he came in to sort of like uh i don't know what he was in there for um because he didn't have anything to eat or drink <laughs> I can't remember what he came there for, but he um, he stopped by and he just plunked a bunch of uh, papers on the on the table and said, "You want one?" 
So I got to read the newspaper the first time in weeks. Um, but no, um, you get sound guys like that. I mean, they've been doing this for a while. That's what they like doing. And the way he's involved with Amar Bungani is still as a coordinator of investigations. Hmm. So, but then you look up at Mail and Guardian, which is the sort of like umbrella organization. Who's who's in charge of editorial policy now? It's Sipo Kings, who's Smart guy, knows a lot about uh, environmental policy from a very European perspective. Wow. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's this very strange sort of combination of people who write about South Africa as if it's a European country, and then people who write about South Africa as if it's South Africa. And, <laughs> and they manage to occupy the same house but never talk the same language. Hmm. It's very strange. Hmm. So, you know. Yeah, uh, we have a question here in regards to, uh, I mean, we've talked about online activism already, but uh, Neil Pretorius asks, uh, hasn't activism become more prevalent through the digitization of our voices? What does uh, that do to our attitudes towards activism in general? Well, I suppose it depends which kind of activism you're doing. So um, one, the kind of activism that's easy to do and uh, through, through, through the internet is to bully fellow elites. Most of the people sharing information on the internet are there, uh, you know, in, in the, like the people who, who like care about politics, us lot, who are sitting on the stream right now, oh, politics bugs. So what we do is, uh, is we share our opinions and we argue and, you know, uh, we do a bit of research and dig about and philosophize about everything. But... The, the main thing that you're doing and the main thing that actually even journalists, if you watch the, the journalistic circles in America, you watch what they get up to in England, almost all of it is about bullying and policing the opinions of other elites and other journalists and trying to ruin as many lives on the other side of the fence as you possibly can. Mm. And it's extremely bitter, extremely brutal. It just keeps getting worse as well as the stakes get higher, you know, because the culture wars are really, really coming to a head now, especially now in the United States where they're having open, you know, exchanges of machine gun fire in the streets yeah. of Kenosha. So, yeah. uh, I mean, I picked a really, really bad day to complain about a, a, a land invasion on Twitter because everyone is sharing the Kenosha nonsense. Everyone is talking about that, yeah. No, it's, uh, it's interesting because the thing is about uh, online activism, and uh, I think we touched on this uh, the previous time we talked, and that's how politics is becoming so globalized as well that, uh, for example, you're talking now about uh, you want people to pay attention to your South Africa-based cause, but they're all talking about an incident in America, and I'm talking about South Africans talking about an incident in America. Yeah. And uh, that's what I find so interesting about the, the internet era, or as the internet matured, it's almost a, it's like that song from... Uh, <laughs> um, uh, we're uh, we're living in a oh, what it's the man it's this one uh anyway i'll get to it now um so it's as if we're living in america everyone in the world uh, even though uh, it, it's oh the not, ramstein song we're all living in america yes uh, it's it's the same idea that people are reacting to things like, for example, someone getting shot in uh, in America. They're re reacting like it's in their community, as if it's something that happened in South Africa. With the type of righteous indignation I'm seeing from a lot of people on Twitter and social media, that's just an example. And it's an interesting phenomenon because then you activism also forms itself around that phenomenon where people start joining activistic causes for countries that they don't live in or not weren't even born in. You were at least born in South Africa, so that gives you a tether to the country that you're doing activism in now from a distance. But a lot of people are joining activistic causes and uh, contributing to activistic causes to countries that they've never had an association with and activistic uh, uh, and they're not doing it because it makes them feel good. They're doing it because they almost feel like they're part of that community. It's almost like the lines are getting blurred and through the internet discourse and uh, the global community, if you want to call it, is becoming more of a thing. It's come, becoming more of a, a global consciousness that's uh, that's purveying the, the online sphere. Yeah, I mean, but I think it also helps that the Anglosphere has a common culture, mm. you know? So it, it, it sort of, it, there's a sort of... Um, I mean, there's influence in, on the of the American system on the continent. They all speak English, but there's there's a I don't know how to put it, but th they have a sort of distance from it. They have a, a little bit of distance from it. They have very different ways of 
um, they have very different ways of approaching political issues. And um, because I mean, I I saw Black Lives Matter protest uh, signs in Stellenbosch in 2015 already, and it was the most bizarre thing. Yeah, me. looking at it, I was like, but you know what this? And this was before it was even this big movement. It was already big, but it wasn't as big as today. And you got this sense of when it was purely more focused on police brutality and a lot less of a Marxist uh, tone to it, even though it was the yeah. origin. It, it was very strange to see how people would be just as passionate about a cause in the United States being South African uh, and uh, not really realizing what's going on in regards to realizing the how absurd their, their activism really is. No, it makes sense to me, though. Um, you, you know, you, you're thinking about these countries as if they have a border, but there's that we, we share common policymaking institutions. We share common ethnicity, uh, ethnicities across these boundaries. We share, uh, we share a media landscape. We share a culture. We share institutions. The United States, South Africa, United Kingdom, New Zealand, Australia, um, all of these places have something in common which is that we speak english we have common law uh, we have common law societies we uh we have an experience of british uh, of british colonialism and there's also the whole thing of black and white hmm. so now black and white is not, is not like it's not something that matters a huge deal to someone in rural russia i mean a black guy is just like a totally to someone in rural russia a black man is just so totally weird and alien. They don't really know what to think about him. Mm. And so one of the few black people who showed up to showed up to Russia, one of the few, first people who ran for politics in, in Russia as a black man actually won his ticket and has been a mayor of some town out there for ages. It, they're just, they, they don't have, they don't have a history. They don't have a, um, a whole thing going on. And because black people, if they come to Russia at all in, in the little numbers that they do, they have to integrate because they're so ISO. They can't form their own communities exactly. Mm -hmm. But in the United States, you have whole black communities. You have white communities. They are divided. And human beings naturally sort of segregate a little bit when you're looking at like n residential neighborhoods. I mean, you can have quite a mixed neighborhood to, uh, to a degree, but people will tend to pick people who are a bit like them, whether it's by, whether the division is by race or class or you know, music taste or aesthetics or whatever the case may be, eventually you'll get people will form little clusters. That that just mm -hmm. normally happens. And so, I mean, you can look at the, every suburb in Cape Town has a totally different personality, for example. I mean, you, why is, for example, you can just take two white, uh, two white um, neighborhoods. Like, <clears throat> you take something like, um, I don't know, Edgemead, and um observatory hmm. they're anything like each other those are white anglo neighborhoods through and through always have been totally different hmm. totally different crowd totally different people actually interesting something i read about the the first planet of the apes form uh, the something uh, unconscious happened there that was actually quite fascinating now you have all these oaks and suits uh, some people are dressed as hmm. orangutans some as chimpanzees and unconsciously, the orangutans at lunch sat together and the chimpanzees, because they, they can't take off their suits because it takes too long to put on the makeup again and uh, reassemble the suits again. So everyone was just walking around in their suits all day and they unconsciously started creating little groups of all the, the different species together. Yeah, I mean, look, this, the, the, the thing is that, I mean, people have mathematically modeled this. If you give, if you put like all of these dots on a grid and then you describe a neighborhoods, and then you say this person wants one out of every 16 of their neighbors to be the same as them. They have, that's all it requires. Eventually you have a very segregated distribution. So even very, very weak in-group preferences develop um, things like that. Um, yeah, Kyle agree. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you ask people why Lanasia is so different from the neighboring um, suburbs, and you get like, oh, I don't know, because it's Indian. <laughs> so, um, but I mean, the thing is, Cape Town, also people just go from one neighborhood to another, and they're chilled. People always accept you for the most part, but they remain fairly different. Hmm.
I think so the thing you, is that the the the, the blackness that, that that crosses over that allows Black Lives Matter to form is that all of these countries share an experience of race that is that was I mean look I don't mean to sound like one of these um sort of decolonist decolonial people but it's true it was formed by an experience of colonialism there's a sort of residual common memory of what that arrangement was it was you know white domination over black subservience and there was all and and in all of these countries except england itself there was segregation but the 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 colonists who came back to the um the sort of the, who who went to the motherland in the last in the post war period um while they fitted into some degree there was also a lot of anti immigrant uh, maneuvers especially in the 1970s and 80s there were like skinhead gangs and funny things like that and so there's always a tension there's always a tension and you're not going to make it go away overnight and there's always people who are going to have, find solidarity across borders in those in that fashion <laughs> Uh, so then at the same time to get back to the to the topic of uh, activism i saw you tweeted out this week in regards to the topic of right wing activism and the the right wing mm. actually having to put their egos aside and do something embarrassing for a change <laughs> yeah <laughs> i, I you, think i think there was this kind of a subtweet to 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 the um to to um a crowd of intellectuals online who are referred to as neo reactionaries mm. And there's a big feature of it because their their big thinker is a uh, is a San Francisco intellectual called well he's a computer programmer first called Mencius Moldbug or Curtis Yarvin which is his real name Moldbug is his online handle yeah. and one of the things he sort of says is well you know don't act don't do anything you know uh, it's these things are gonna everything's gonna fall apart eventually and, um, and you in the meantime have to make yourself worthy of doing something productive when the necessity appears and in the meantime all you're really going to do is cause trouble for yourself when it's not necessary and you're not going to solve anything all of this is fruitless and there's that pervading attitude amongst a lot of these sort of um so these actual intellectual types on the right where there's a very sort of defeated attitude they don't they feel reluctant to push back. They even the ones who aren't completely behind Yarvin. There's definitely this very sort of it's all over feeling, because the left has won so completely, so completely everywhere in the Western world. Just guzzling down black pills. Yeah, and it's not even about that. I mean, even the people who say, "Yeah, this is all going to go to hell in a handcart," you know, their form of optimism is, um, you know, well, when it collapses we will be prepared for it kind of a thing and i'm not talking right. about like the survivalist types i mean because a lot of them a lot of these people that i'm referring to they don't think that it's going to be total civilizational collapse they're talking about a state collapse and then there will be consolidation around new units and so on um and that they'll be positioned for the for, for, for the moment um uh, but, I honestly think a lot of these oaks, uh, these internet tough guys that say they're ready for the collapse, uh, they they're gonna die in proportions just the same to the rest. Yeah, I mean it's it's you know chaos is an equal opportunity killer, um, and even the best prepared are gonna get caught by shrapnel. So it, it's really one of those things you don't want collapse. You have to mm. do what you have to do, and I think one has to have, and I mean. God, I mean, look, okay, I really hate Nietzsche. I really do. Um, I think he's awful. But he does have that one idea that's quite nice, which is that sort of amor fati, love thy fate kind of vibe, where you just sort of embrace the natural consequences. It's, a, I think, it's a healthy attitude to have. Fate but I guides think that willing and drags along the reluctant. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I should have probably, I, I could probably have expressed that same sort of uh, attitude by referring to the Stoics or even referring to sort of basic christianity jesus take the wheel you know i'm just going to keep on trucking um plebeian christianity i like it um but it, it, it's a it, it's the sort of vibe where if you're living for the material reward that you're going to be getting out of your activity anytime you look at the scale of 
the systems that you're actually confronted with in the real world, you're going to become defeatist. I mean, what we've got today, we have this huge, huge universe that is online now. Mm. The scale of the organizations that you are putting yourself against, if you want to make change, are right. absolutely enormous. And it doesn't help that the millennial and the Gen Z generation, to a large extent, were pretty much fed this uh, this very big misconception and I think pretty cruel lie that you, your mission needs to be to change the world. You need to become president. Uh, you need to save the world. I think it's one of the most harmful things you can teach people. Don't aim for changing the world because you're always going to be, you're going to end up very bitter and uh, disappointed that you couldn't do it uh, all on your own. You should start off by changing, like I said at the beginning of the stream, change your community, change your household, change your street, change your little uh, your little uh, piece of the of society and move from there. Start with achievable goals. Don't set off with goal one, I'm going to change the entire world because the world is an unimaginably big place. Yeah, but I mean, one of the one of the awful things that you're going to run into is that I mean, let's say you're wanting to vote for a uh, you 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 you're, okay. Forget voting for a second. You you've got an issue on your street, and um, what's a really good example? Let's say you need to fix your roof, right? Mm. But now you need planning permission. Why do you need planning permission? Because now there's new regulations on how you're allowed to fix. And so, you know, you let's say everyone else has had this problem and given up and you're at a braai with your neighbors and you all decide, okay, I'm going to do something about this. And then you lobby locally and you see, try and see if you can, uh, you can deal with it. And you realize, no, actually, it's, national level, um, it's a national level obstruction. No one, can, no one on, your, uh, on your street can afford to do it this way. Um, and then you ask yourself, well, where do these regulations come from? And if you're in Europe, for example, the EU, the EU is making these regulations. Shit that tells you what kind of fittings you can put on your window. Shit that tells you like w what kind of plugs you're allowed to have in your wall and, and uh, the light fittings you're allowed to have in your – that kind of stuff. And it's all set by people that you no one is allowed to appeal to uh, in any way. And not only that, but then it's set at an even higher level again because you have um, you have the United Nations. And the United Nations goes further than this because they are countries that are not entirely in step with their their totalitarian program. And I mean, look, I know that sounds that sounds like an exaggeration to most people if I say UN's totalitarian, but I mean that they they have this idea, and I think they've had it for a very long time. Jan Smuts was uh, was talking about it back when he was uh, he was instrumental in the negotiations after the Second World War. He went in. He he worked overtime to get into as many communities as he could because he had this idea that it ought to actually penetrate every aspect of life in the states that it lived in. So, w what they do is they tend to send like NGOs and consultation bodies and funny things to to build partnerships with local governments. And so, in a funny little way, you get something that's sort of a weaker version of a Soviet government where you have. Uh, like in Canada, it's particularly prevalent. They've you 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 get a lot of these local um, NGOs and bodies that are invited to advise on all of the laws that are made at a local level and all of the policies that are passed, and then they get passed in in conjunction with like Millennium Development Goals and sustainability and all of these weird big buzzwords that sound very nice but have technical meanings that actually apply to specific policies designed in the United Nations. Um, and you'll see an effect of it like in um, in South Africa with our uh, our school curriculum, a lot of which is designed by UNICEF. So then you ask yourself, so how, you want to fix up your local community. You've got a problem because you've got these big nasty buggers in the way who've got a million and one regulations you're going to have to deal with. Um, so things get very complicated, and there's, there's an awful mixture that you need um, – of people who are very locally engaged and people who have knowledge of high level interactions between global institutions and domestic ones this gets this gets ridiculously complicated and the more complex the world gets the harder it is for people to act because i mean not only you at the local level but people in charge which is why a lot of the laws get increasingly silly
I mean, you look at something like COVID-19. I mean, does anyone think that it's being done properly anywhere? I mean, forget whether or not you think one true one case is true or not. Just apropos of nothing, do does anyone think this is being run well anywhere in the world? No, it's 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 a catastrophe. It's a it's a huge mess. So one of the themes that I've picked up on in the chat, so we've actually had a, quite a few questions on them, so I'll condense them into a, into a more smaller and more concise theme. And that is the question of uh, the means of protest in regards to is a peaceful protest the, the, the core principle that one needs to stick to or is violent protest and uh, violent protest the selling of your soul uh, or making a deal with the devil? I mean that's that's actually a hectically difficult question. I don't think anyone realizes how hard that is. Um, I think there's always a point that you can get to where um, there's always a point that you can get to where where just violence would be justified. Hmm. But f picking a point where that is is. I mean, it's very difficult. Right. I think that's why there's so many questions surrounding it because nobody really has the answer. Because you can always uh, commit yourself to an ideal, but even an ideal can't really sometimes be enough to to really get you any type of uh, uh, any type of result. Because yeah. I mean, that's what you've seen in South Africa when you talk to the average protester. That's not an ideologue. That's not a uh, possessed by ideology. They will still tell you uh, something very similar along the lines of, but uh, through violence and through destruction is the only way that we get the attention of government. Uh, and oh this, yeah. Protesters that are, for example, uh, say making fires or setting things alight outside a municipal mm. building because the municipal building is the closest manifestation of government they can find. Yeah, I mean, one of the big problems of that that they have to confront is that often violence is also ignored. Right. So it's not about whether or not you're using vi uh, violence. If you're going to be talking about what's effective, um, then it's it's kind of a question of whether you can actually build legitimacy in the meantime. Mm. So building legitimacy is kind of important. You you have to show that you're following the correct procedures. You have to show that you have broad appeal. You have to show that you are reasonable. That you know what you're talking about. You have to show that you're. Um, uh, that you don't have ulterior motives. You have to show there's all of these different angles. And getting to the point where you actually can legitimize violence, that's actually the point, is a lot of people, particularly on the left, they have the... I mean, it's not just the left. There are people on the right as well who are who are like this, but there are fewer of them. Um, I mean, the proportions aren't even uh, anything that you can debate about. It's pretty clear. Yeah, yeah. The proportions are very heavily on the left, that violence is a good thing in itself um it's almost a virtue yeah i mean it's, it's more about the indignation well one of the one of the things about it is that there's there's a sort of there's a thread that's running through a lot of left-wing political theory is that any system that you're opposed to is inherently illegitimate hmm. and you're overthrowing the whole thing it's about revolution and so when you're a revolutionary there is no law there is no moral that can stand in your way so it's an abandonment of all principles except what functions. Hmm. Um, and so, I mean, like you can get like Saul Alinsky who would go out of his way to do all kinds of things and you'd mix sort of, um, you, you mix petitions and all kinds of things with uh, the use of intimidation or the use of uh, 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 ambiguous fraud or there you go. And the you know infiltration of institutions i mean look the most but i mean he's got nothing on the scientologists though they if you want to if you want to look at a group that actually understands activism it's the scientologists they're that, that angle sorry i've never heard that angle no they had the most successful infiltration of uh, of a united states uh, department of the, in history it was enormous um, they got in absolutely everywhere, and the thing is that one one of the th one of the things that you'll notice about this is you actually need a very cult like devotion to get people to do that kind of long form engagement. 
uh, to do infiltration. So you'll see there's a, there was a lot of it that happened in the 1930s and 40, 1920s and 30s, perhaps, I'd say better, um, under the guise of the Soviet Union. They got people to infiltrate the Catholic Church, to infiltrate Western universities, Western bureaucracies, all kinds of stuff. Um, um, particularly journalists. Journalists were... Yeah, that was that was a hectic one. Um, yeah, that's a very, uh, very poignant point uh, coming off the back of uh, Yuri Bezmenov being mainstreamed by Call of Duty this week. Oh yeah, I mean, but the thing about Yuri Bezmenov is, it's 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 sort of by the time he was talking about it, it was already too late. I mean, yeah. they started doing this in the nineteen, you know, thirties, twenties, um, and it took over the universities through the whole period of the war and there were massive reforms uh, across the western world during this period um which put communist and socialist positions in the universities universities teach everyone who goes to university that this is the only way you solve problems this is the way the economy works this is the way morality and society works uh, and then all of them become school teachers um and then they put the stuff in the curriculums i mean it's, uh, the second that the civil rights movement was done you already had all of these people um I mean, like, if you want to look at where the where the idea, uh, modern idea of white privilege became sort of embedded, um, you can look at like a school. There's, I, I can't remember the name, but I can find a link for you if you want. There's, um, it's from the 1971. You got already, uh, uh, <laughs> goose. Uh, yeah, no, but uh, there's already in 1971. There's a school teacher, and it was like a primary school teacher, who got who designed, um. She was connected to an activist group, and she wrote a textbook about this pedagogical textbook. And basically, the problem she was confronting was that now that blacks and whites had equal rights, um, you know, if a black kid picked on a white kid in class, there was no longer there was no longer a very obvious thing to say. You know, uh, actually, it would be weird to hit back because you have an obvious privileged position, etc. Um, but instead, instead, you, she she would hear a white kid saying, "No, no, no, we're equal. We have to share, or you can't do that, or whatever." And she says, "No, the kid, the the, the white kid must understand that it comes from a place of pain and suffering, and therefore that they can't really resist. They shouldn't really be resisting." So, teaching kids to supplicate themselves to black demands for unfair demands from black kids, or bullying, or whatever. That's kind of the thing that ended up motivating the development of our modern sort of woke position on race as early as then. Uh, you know, the whole idea of racism is prejudice plus power, and therefore you're automatically racist. Right, right. Um, and the, and the, the yeah. emergence of ideas, our friend uh, Quentin Ferreira has coined the eternal apartheid. Yeah, I mean, this the, it it's this whole original sin vibe that you get, but instead of it being a universal feature of human nature, it's something that purely strikes the one ethnicity in in the population. I mean, uh, it's a uh, it's Christianity without the prospect of redemption. Or that would be one way of putting it. Although, um, I don't know, it's a lot more mm. brutal than that. It reminds it, it's a lot like sort of caste Hinduism. Mm. Uh, here's a question for you, Rob. Uh, Al Bono asks, did you know all these facts uh, but not believe them before you walked away from communism, or is it uh, newly learned? Ach, no, I all picked this up in the last few years. Um, when I was a communist, I was a communist. I was interested in uh, United States crimes overseas, uh, imperialism. I was interested in all the shenanigans that the United Kingdom got up to, like, I mean, one of my favorite ones to pull out of a hat because it was so obscure and I felt so smart about it was, um, I mean, it's not that obscure anymore. Every bloody leftist knows this one now, um, is the Chagos Islanders. Um, so what happened is that in 1967, the United States wanted a military base um, in, in the Indian Ocean. Um, and so the... United Kingdom acting on their behalf sort of fabricated a fabricated a colony in this like weird archipelago where um the descendants of Indian and African traders had they lived there was like about eight thousand somewhere between eight and ten thousand of them um that had been living on this island and they sort of they fabricated a new colony and instead of going through parliament they the um prime minister I think it was Wilson 
at the time. He got the, the queen to sign what is called an order in council. So an order in council is a special order where the queen just says by fiat. It's like, you know, what the president would call uh, the executive orders in, in the United States. So uh, it, it's effectively the prime minister of the UK ex using executive power like that. Oh. And they deported all of them to the Seychelles. Was it the Seychelles or was it Mauritius? I can't remember which now. Uh, um well, I mean, I think the reason that the communists excel at infiltration is that they naturally can promote democracy. And the Western world has already sort of takes democracy as a fundamentally good value. And what people might think is funny to say is that communists are actually demo Democrats. They're hardcore fundamentalist Democrats. Hmm. They believe that everything ought to be democratized. But you cannot have democracy if people are unequal because the power is unequal and therefore all their voices are unequal and they're being manipulated and controlled and enslaved and so on so communism is really about freedom mm. and i mean that uh, and it, it sounds like a propaganda um, line for them <laughs> but it's the, that's the perverse thing is it's it's a very weird kind of freedom that comes with no responsibilities this kind of ideal freedom one feels on i don't know heroin before you continue rob uh, i forgot about this when you were talking about your uh, activist project today uh, i haven't put a link to your tweet uh, in the description of this video i will afterwards after we are done chatting but i will put it in the in the chat so long for anyone that was interested you can go follow that link and go check out uh, what rob's been uh, running around yeah. doing all day here today <coughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, um, I'm, I, I appreciate it a lot. That's thank you very much. I mean, look, the, the the reason this is important, aside from aside from the sort of local issues, is I think it, it also intersects. Sorry to use a really uh, <laughs> awful word, um, but but it, it it it's at the intersection of of a lot of major national issues. So public health and civil rights and civil liberties and housing and. <coughs> land and property rights and hmm. these are all really really big ticket issues and i'm actually uh, i'm surprised that something quite as um, incisive as this has come along one of the things that the, the i mean look i i'm not one of these people who thinks that the response to the coronavirus is proportionate hmm. but it certainly is um a public uh, something of public health concern um i think and I think that if you're having a situation where you're repeatedly getting, I mean, this is a thing you repeat, get repeatedly get these novel viruses that are emerging from China. Um, and the, a lot of people theorize that this is down to a combination of personal hygiene issues. I mean, look, it depends who you ask and this is very politically incorrect, but I'm afraid this is, this is a thing. Uh, it's, wet markets it's personal hygiene and and its proximity to livestock i mean this is exactly why the europe was 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 rife with plagues for hundreds of years um and when you're looking at a situation uh, that, that's going on in in in, in kailicha at the moment you you get you you lose the ability to control the, the animal population you lose the ability to control the diseases there you're going to start i mean you see you're going to start seeing a major explosion in uh zoonotic diseases i'm really glad to see the the real film and publication board is subscribed to this channel uh thank you very much for for taking part in the chat uh, i really do appreciate it that mm. someone from, a, from a, a very esteemed institution is trying to censor the south african internet is really uh, taking up of my show well at least they're watching it before they shut it down <laughs> they're <laughs> they're bandits with honor rob so <laughs> hmm. Yeah, uh, it's maybe. not like the old days where they where they would ban something like uh, uh, Black Beauty because of the title, you know. <laughs> right. So, Rob, I think uh, a nice thing to end this uh, this conversation on is to to go into what, what that tweet that we talked about earlier, where you mentioned the the right wing needing to embrace activism. But maybe you can get into. Your advice and your your realistic guide for rules for radicals for the for the right wing in regards to what you can do to become more activistic without becoming too cringe and kind of uh, hating yourself for it. No, I think it's actually get over the cringe. It's a lot like um, when you look at how 
new parents have to convert their behavior and get over their sort of posturing um, nonsense from their teenage and early 20s mm. um, and just sort of embrace the, the 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 kind of awkwardness of normal life just just get over it just embrace it i think that's fine but what what makes the right different from left radicals is that we actually care about morality rather than merely end goals hmm. the 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 left there's uh, if you read something like Real, rules for radicals one of the things that comes out of it is there's absolutely nothing that's off the table right now uh, yeah. It's uh, if you can embarrass your opponent, destroy your opponent, the, the worst thing you can do or the worse you can embarrass or destroy your opponent, the better. And yeah. that's the that's the, the thing. Big takeaway I got from that book. Yeah. I mean, the thing is that you can't you can't play by those rules. You, you have yeah. to be a saint. You have to be an absolute saint. Um, I'm not going to manage that because I'm very rough around the edges. And I think. Um, the second I become a public figure and people start digging into my life, ba my background, my years as a, as a student when I was a, you know, heavy, par hard partying, womanizing, dope smoking communist, <laughs> is that a lot of nasty things are going to come out of the woodwork because I wasn't as well behaved as I am now. Um, but I mean, the thing is, you you engage in a protest as a right winger, even uh, you can watch even acts of self defense. Um, even even if if you're conservative, and you're involved in protest, or you're involved in any sort of activism, you're considered dangerous. You're considered next door to Hitler. Conservatives are supposed to sort of wring their hands in quiet and write articles, and even then they're sort of considered to you know smell vaguely of sulfur. So the thing is, you've got to be prepared for the fact that you are going to be demonized, even for the most anodyne experiences, and. So you have to be prepared to let it, to be have your whole life raked through with a fine tooth comb and demonstrate that you're actually pure of heart. I saw this uh, this comment from Tini, uh, me rough too. <laughs> me me rough too. Sorry, I, I I'm very you, confused. You talked about uh, you're a bit rough around the edges, and he's just commenting like, oh, uh, okay. yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> No, I mean, like, I'm, I'm very, I'm a very tame person. I'm not, I'm not exactly, um, you know, like a streetwise thug with a switchblade or anything like that. I'm just a, uh, a reformed degenerate, I would say. Um, mm. But so, yeah, yeah the bottom line be, is be a good person as yeah, much as you possibly can, and yeah, engage person. honestly, and engage locally, and try to appeal to people's real. Uh, interest. Don't don't be too concerned about uh, engaging people who are not on your side. If they if they have real concerns, and they're real concerns, as opposed to say, um, uh, you know, online sh ideological shenanigans. People in the real world who have real concerns, get involved with that. Don't get involved with ideological. Uh, muggery on the internet. I mean, look, the internet is there. You're going to have to use it from time to time, but use it for, for uh, you use it for a campaign like this that has nothing to do with ideology. It's just it's the right thing to do. It's a problem that needs to be solved. Ideology doesn't have to come into it. You establish your reputation as someone who's earnest and uh, and and is after the good of everyone who's proximate to him. And you get further. And I mean, I know I'm dragging on your time a little bit here, but uh, I, I just wanted to point this out: is mm. there's the there's the idea that one wants to bond with people on the basis of, yeah, this is an interesting point. This this ties into, in, into the difference between Christianity and this weird kind of uh, doppelganger Christian value that you get from the left, right? Mm. So. There's there's a there's a quote there are a couple of quotes that all of them are from like 19th century guys um, but they're really illustrative. So um, there's Joseph de Mestre talking about the rights of man and all of that kind of stuff that came out of the French Revolution and saying, well I've met Italians and Germans and Frenchmen but I've never met this man. You know, <laughs> yeah, there's this yeah, yeah. very very abstract idea of humanity that the left will cl uh, cling on to and. Also, that nationalists will cling on to a very abstract and irreal version of their own ethnicity, this idealized person that doesn't really exist, or as the English would say, 
uh, it's uh, it sounds a bit Kantian in terms of the thing in itself. Yes, this thing that doesn't exist. You don't. It's it's trying to have this platonic form of nonsense that you reach in the meal. It's not real. The the neighbor you're supposed to love in Christianity is your name. It's it's people you've developed tangible relationships and duties to by virtue of your human contact with them. Your family, your friends, your neighbors, these people. That's where you develop um that's where you develop your moral obligations. Mm. But what the communists want to do is they'll say everyone is your neighbor. Mm. And because everyone is your neighbor, nobody is. And it becomes yeah, it becomes the, the whole who you're supposed to feel solidarity with or who you have a moral commitment to at any given time is just something that you're supposed to play with um, f- uh, to serve whatever the imagination conjures up. And it has no real b- bearing on reality and causes awful, awful distortions that lead people to their doom. What you really need to do is to retreat back to something that is real tangible and is based on human duties and care for one another and that has to arise from the local it has to arise from the personal and i mean this particular issue that i got into is because a friend of mine reached out to me because um, a former client said we need help and i said yes i believe in this issue i believe that it is righteous and i believe i can do something and so i think that all activism has to come from that and not to feel afraid, not to feel awkward, not to try and inject it with your personal ideological stuff. I mean, yeah, the ideology and your understanding of the greater world will inform what you do, but it's really about helping people and uh, helping people out and serving them, you know, mm. as much as you can. Mm. I see uh, uh, Dick Tran says, CC, please do a stream of Starbird Disagrees. Uh, I would love to do another stream of him. I did Mm. a stream of him uh, more than a year ago, but I don't know. I see he's back to making videos. I don't know if he's back to doing streams, but if he is, I'll definitely get in contact with him. Uh, You can always uh, drop a hint there at his side that uh, he's welcome on my show, but I'll definitely get in contact with him again. So yeah, Rob, uh, we're at mm. close to the end of the show now in regards mm. to our, our activism in theory and practice. Uh, you've outlined the the in practice part of it very thoroughly. I've put a link again in the description for people yeah. to or in the chat for people to check out. So if you're not watching this live, there will be a link in the description that you can click to really go see what Rob's talking about. Uh, otherwise, we'd be here for another two hours if we had to go into into real depth into the whole timeline and what's uh, to come. But uh, I'll be keeping a close eye on that and seeing how it progresses. And I think it was an excellent opportunity for you to to really test out some of your theory. I mean, it's easy to be a preacher. Uh, it's a bit more hard to, to live by it. So uh, I think this is a very interesting uh, arc that you are busy yeah. with. Uh, you make the video on activism and now you get this opportunity to really live it out and test your theory. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very... Um, I don't know if it'll succeed. But I think it's something that I have to try. I have to do. I have to do the best that I can to try and help the situation out because it's it's the right thing to do. It's uh, it's like Jan Rabi said. So I'm translating. Uh, he's an Afrikaans philosopher, and he said uh, it's always uh, worth it to try because it's better to fight against the entire world than against your own conscience. Oh, that's a lacquer quote. That is a lacquer quote. That's very good. Hmm. No, I like so, yeah. it. Uh, thank you very much, Rob, for uh, again coming uh, for to give us some insight into what you were doing today and into your project and also into your latest video. And thanks for giving us some valuable insight for me and the audience in regards to your thoughts on activism and uh, what the way forward is for people that are activistically minded. Um, but yeah, I'll definitely have you on again in the future. And then thanks again, everyone, for tuning in and giving uh, your questions and doing your part in the chat for uh, to enrich the conversation and the contributing uh, to the whole experience and to the content because that's what uh, distinguishes us from the mainstream where they shut down their comment sections <laughs> I made the comment section part of the content so thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening guys and god bless god bless